Good morning. Morning. I'm getting a spinning wheel of death for my camera, so it doesn't appear to be showing me, but I'll try to fix it. So we have, we have um, Chair's Corner Spine Conference, and then uh, Travis is presenting today. Travis Great. Caton, not Travis Lander. <laughs> the other Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many neurosurgery departments have two Travises. Yeah, it can't be too many. Are we going to, uh, let's raise the, uh, elevate the, the, up they come now. I'm working on it now. <clears throat> Ray, are you still over at Elmhurst? Yes, I am. How's it going over there? Um, recently has been recently has been okay. Our census is um under control, and also most importantly is that we're our, our staffing has been pretty good. Dr. Hickman has been um has um recruited a, a really good set of per diem PAs, and um our shifts have been covered pretty pretty well. Yeah, good. Well, you know, that was not so easy because health and hospitals was really behind on, um, you know, their support for that program. <laughs> but I'm glad it's getting its feet on the ground again, because it was getting a little tenuous there, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, we were pretty short. Uh, yeah towards like the tail end of um, last year, but right now, right, right now we're pretty good. Good. Okay, uh, this, this will be a really short one, I hope, I believe. Uh, we're just gonna go over a simple case that we did last week. Uh, remember to record your attendance. Do you know how well people have been doing this? I think our attendance recording has been pretty good. Um, Maggie and I were going to go over it soon now that it's been a while. Um, I don't know how good our um, our survey after attendance recording, recording has been, but she and I can look into it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, uh, you know, we do a lot of pituitary surgery uh, at Mount Sinai, and this is something that was brought to Mount Sinai by Cal Post in the early 90s. Uh, prior to that, although there were transphenoidal procedures done and um, people were taught how to do it, it was a very small uh, service. And, uh, and Cal brought his practice, which was uh, the biggest pituitary practice, one of the biggest in the Northeast and country, and sort of brought that into the Mount Sinai community. It elevated the endocrine department, and that legacy has persisted with uh, one of the busiest, the busiest pituitary service in Manhattan, according to the recent data that I received. Uh, with a number of surgeons capable and excellent at it, and uh, Raj and I doing a fairly high volume of, of these cases. So this is a very typical presentation 
this is a, a man who was uh, did not really recognize the nature of his visual loss, thought that he needed new glasses and went to an optometrist. And it's very common that we get referrals from optometry offices not necessarily an individual, or but it could be, uh, you know, we often don't even hear the name of the optometrist, but optometrist sees that the visual loss is something that cannot be corrected uh, or recognizes a field cut, and they are trained to recognize the field cut, um, recognizes significant asymmetry in the exam, and alarms start going off. They recommend the, the patient uh, the client gets an MRI scan or sees a neurologist, which is what happened here, uh, which led to the discovery of this pituitary tumor. Um, then came the endocrine evaluation and a serum cortisol level that was very, very low. So this is typically what we receive in the office and we'll complete the endocrine workup which was normal other than the cortisol. We confirmed a bitemporal hemianopsia and not surprisingly, the left eye was the one whose acuity was reduced because you can see that this is a um, leftward projecting tumor, not small. Uh, it, it encroaches on and kind of crowds around the carotids, but does not encircle them. And so this is still a case where it might be possible to get a good resection. Our goal of surgery is going to be to decompress the optic apparatus, get as much of the tumor out as we can, but we're not necessarily going to go for broke. Um, the risks being injury to the oculomotor nerves, the optic chiasm, the carotid, the anterior cerebral perforators, uh, basilar, etc. if we get too aggressive. So just thinking about now whether we're going to be able to get a complete resection, Ray, what do you think some of the factors are other than the ones I've mentioned? What's going to determine how hard or easy it is to get a complete resection of this tumor? Just think about some of the surgical things you've seen so far with me and with others in the OR. Um, yeah, uh, so the biggest thing I can think of is uh, the consistency of the tumor. If it's um, soft and very like easy, easily peeled off and very um, very easily going into the suction, that, then that, that will definitely facilitate us getting a, um, a better resection. But on the other hand, if it's like very firm, a very tough tumor, then um, then that that will get difficult. And also, like how stuck it is to the um, to the uh, to the diaphragm. So, like we're always um, actively trying to avoid a CS CSF leak. So, if the tumor is also very stuck to the di diaphragm, um, we might we might consider leaving some residual rather than rather than risking a leak. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you you said uh, there were two things that you said uh, that I want to bring out. One. Uh, and then the other thing that you didn't mention is how vascular it is. I think that okay. sometimes uh, when it's very, very bloody, the, the fine dissection that you would like to be able to do is limited. Um, but you mentioned two things that are, are a little bit different from each other. When a tumor is soft and suckable, it gives you one way of removing it. Uh, but you also use the word peel away. Uh, and peel... Uh, refers to a, a, a membrane, a pseudomembrane, a capsule, a pseudocapsule. But it, it, when we use the word peel, uh, we're really talking about prying away and separating a tumor that has some sort of consistency to it from the surrounding structures. When a pituitary tumor is extremely soft, it's hard to peel it. Uh, because it's so soft that there's almost nothing to grab onto. And so uh, actually it can be helpful. And we've we've discussed this, I think, when we're talking about removing other benign tumors like schwannomas, that a really truly mushy schwannoma can sometimes be more difficult to remove 
away from the brain stem than one that has a certain firmness or consistency to it so that you can put a little pressure on one part of the tumor and pull it away and develop that plane between the pseudocapsule and the normal brain structures. So what you're hoping for is something that's soft enough that you can use a curette and firm enough so that you can peel it. Uh, and who knows uh, when, you get it, when you're gonna get a tumor just like that. Uh, so let's go to the videotape and uh, see what we have here. Um, I have three. I think this is the early one. Uh, now, I, I did this case, uh, uh, you know, we work with ENT, and in, in general, ENT is going to be holding the scope on the left nostril. Uh, a right-handed neurosurgeon will want to stand on the right side of the patient. And we've discussed that this angle has some limitations uh, here. Uh, and what I've noticed in working with a whole department of ENT surgeons is how important it is and how uh, experienced, how important it is how experienced the operator is. Uh, the camera is something that is moves dynamically with the hands of the neurosurgeon. And the movements of the camera are something that either come naturally or we have to describe, but there are a whole host of movements, positions, and um, natural abilities that come, come with this. This is a surgeon who is, uh, was recently trained, completed training. And so you're going to see in this particular case that this camera is moving a lot in and out, but it's not necessarily moving in concert um, with the other, with the uh, surgeons on the right side of the patient. Um, so the other thing you'll notice is that the endoscope takes up five, seven millimeters of space, and it's usually occupying the clock between 11 or 12 o'clock and three or four o'clock. And so the instruments are often limited in, in our resection in this region up here by the endoscope. So during this phase, um, I'm not in the room, but <clears throat> they're opening uh, in this, gone through the sphenoid, uh, have gone through the back of the septum, the nasal septum, um, have connected the two sides and have opened uh, into the sphenoid and opened the sphenoid widely. And we're get, beginning to see the anatomy of the planum, the tuberculum, uh, and then we'll go a little forward and I'll ask you a little bit about this anatomy here. Let's try to find a moment here. This is a good. Okay, so um, Chi, are you with us this morning? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, what do you think we're looking at right here in the middle? Um, that looks like the cellar dura. Perfect. Okay. So this is going to, we've confirmed on our stealth, because we use stealth uh, mostly rather than brain lab for this, um, that this is the midline. Okay. So then uh, going out laterally, what about this? Here, what do you think that is going to be? Um, that's most likely the carotid. Exactly. Carotid on one side, carotid on the other side. <clears throat> uh, is it covered by bone? I believe so. Yeah. Emily, how can I confirm that whether or not this is covered by bone? I think you can use your instrument to lightly touch it. Um, you would expect, obviously, a harder consistency if it's covered by bone. Yeah, good. <clears throat> what uh, any other way? 
think also grossly like visually, it doesn't have that sort of characteristic color of a vessel. Um, it looks like more consistent with the with the rest of the um, cella. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm also going to use a Doppler if I have any doubt. So we, we've got uh, those three things. And then, okay, so if this is the carotid, Emily, then what are we, what are we seeing over here? It looks like nerve to me, and it's it's bilateral, so uh, likely the optic nerve. Okay, well, it is white, and nerve is white, but it's still bone. But you're right, though, that that's going to be the medial portion of the optic canal covered by bone, and you've got still some bone and junk in here. But you're going to have two places. Uh, one over here and one over here. I don't know how much better we expose those during the case. Uh, let's go to the next. Okay, so we've got a higher view here. And we've confirmed with a Doppler, this is the edge of the left cavernous sinus. This is bone. You see there's a little ledge of bone covering the carotid. Uh, and we've extended our bone opening up to here. And we've done the same thing over here. And this amount of blood and so on, this is a fairly bloody case, but this is a normal appearance that uh, you have plenty of blood in the field during this phase of the operation. Um, so this is an angle. This is a this is a named point here. Do you know what that is, Emily? I'm not, I'm not sure. I know it's it's you're looking at the cavernous uh, ICA on either side, but I'm not That's sure. Right. That's right. Um, so if we go back. Uh, Well, I, uh, here, let's just pull this guy back up again. So remember that we have the carotid bone over the cella, medial optic canal, and we're going to see two, and you see it uh, over here as well. It's a recess, and there's one over here and one over here. Halima? That would be the optical carotid recess. Okay. Now, is what about on the medial side and the lateral side? Yep. So there would be the medial and lateral. So on the medial side, that would be the medial optical carotid recess. And then That's right. Um, <clears throat> the MC, the, the MCOR, the medial optical MOCR, the medial optical carotid recess. Why is that an important landmark? Would you say, Halima? Um, it helps us define our sort of extent of bony exposure because it would let us know that um, we would be able, like lateral to the medial optical carotid recess, um, we would, uh, would be our border of, would be our lateral border of our exposure to prevent the carotid from being um, exposed. Yeah, so that's it exactly right. The, the medial optical carotid recess defines the supralateral limit of a transnasal, transnasal uh, exposure for this sort of surgery. Um, and it's the junction between the optic nerve uh, and the carotid artery, essentially, <clears throat> and the cavernous sinus. <clears throat> There's a little bony ridge that sort of travels between them. That's going to end up laterally being the optic strut. Um, but that's a very important landmark. I expose it on almost every single case. And um, we can expose, we can remove more of it. We can expose the carotid. And I will often expose the entire anterior loop of the carotid. And I do that in order to get the flexibility of retracting it when we're going further out into the cavernous sinus. But on a case like this, 
We're going to go bilaterally to the optical carotid recesses and then come across the top along the, the tuberculum, basically, and then all the way down. So now uh, let's get back. And, uh, and so that's what we've done here with this opening. You see there's bone covering the carotid up to the optical carotid recess. <clears throat> you can see that our approach is from left to right. We've made the initial opening into the dura, and we're gonna start taking out the tumor. And here you see that it's soft enough uh, that you can uh, use the curette. <clears throat> and uh, what have you learned, um, Brendan, what have you learned so far about the order of things in terms of removing a large tumor of this size that you want to do the order of the resection properly so that you can get the most out of it, Brendan? What have you learned about that? So usually you want to start by debulking um, the center part of the tumor um, in the medial aspect. Um, and then you debulk, decompress the, the mass, um, let the diaphragm uh, kind of come down, and then you can focus on getting some of the more lateral aspects um, of the periphery of the tumor. Okay. Well, you mentioned certain things that you're going to think about, but actually, that's you, you do the whole one of the points I think that is important is you don't want the diaphragm to come down before you do the lateral aspect. So how do you avoid getting the diaphragm to come down before doing the lateral aspects of the tumor? You can um, uh, work on the most inferior aspects of the tumor first. Um, that's right. right. The, so we start, yeah. that's exactly right. We start on the lower aspect of the tumor. And you can see that that's what we've done here. It's a little hard because everything's moving, but. I will typically use a left or right five millimeter ring curette. And this is, uh, that was a right-sided. Um, we will keep it low and we'll drag it along the bottom of the cella here. And um, this will be the moment where we can send enough specimen for pathology. And you can see we're at the very bottom. Most of the bleeding is coming from inside the tumor. And one of the ways to keep the field clear is to move that sucker around a lot. So I want a pretty large sucker, a fairly high suction, fairly safe to use high suction now. <clears throat> and using the right angled curette, we'll sweep the tumor off the bottom and uh, begin to reach out towards the patient's left side before we have gone into the center, posterior, or superior part of the tumor. And in the early phases, we'll grab a lot of this tumor for pathology. And in later phases, we'll let some of it go up the sucker. Uh, but uh, so we'll progress here. And you see that sometimes there's a lot of bleeding so that so much bleeding that the sucker won't contain it. And in those cases, you can stop for a while and uh, inject a little surgifoam, but then that'll obs obscure your view almost as much as the um, as the bleeding. And so you can tolerate a little bit of bleeding, a little bit of irrigation, and you can maybe inject some surge of foam into the epidural space below the tumor. But um, we'll now switch to a left angled curette. So we'll do the same thing on the left side as we've done on the right side, right side of the patient as we do on the left side. Um, and so now We've removed the whole bottom of the tumor from left to right, and we're gonna start working our way up the left lateral side and begin to address the center part of the tumor. And we'll start to look for the diaphragm. Uh, and typically we'll see the diaphragm either uh, in the back or the front, but towards the side. And uh, I think in this particular case, we're gonna see it up here, right there. We just got a glimpse of it. And I'll go back there and see if I can freeze frame this for you. Sometimes, there, There's, there it is. And you know, sometimes these things just are, are quite fleeting, but once you get a sense of it, 
uh, you know where you're going to see it again. And um, <clears throat> there is a little bit of structure to this tumor so that we can hope to peel it away. You know, it's, it's messy. Uh, and sometimes these are a little messy until you get the whole tumor out. Uh, but what we're going to do is try to peel it away. And uh, we'll want to put some counter traction on the, the uh, diaphragm. And typically, we'll do that by taking a cotinoid, um, as you'll see coming in to the field here. Um, there you see that there's the diaphragm. And um, putting counter traction here with the suction. And this is this is so-called peeling. Um, here, the cotinoid's not helping. We've identified a fairly robust 38-year-old diaphragm. Um, and so we're going to peel this tumor away. And I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But um, then the next thing that I often do is coagulate the um, the diaphragm with the aquamantis. And you can see it right here. Uh, aquamantis will firm up, thicken, and shrink the diaphragm and allow a more robust dissection. So here you see the junction between diaphragm and tumor. There, right there. You see that cleft there? Right here. Diaphragm above, tumor below. And um, you know, you'll get a sense of what the diaphragm will tolerate. And eventually we can get uh, a better dissection. We're going to come after this last little piece here after we've gotten the rest out. Uh, we'll reach out laterally again one more time. Um, and eventually, we should be able to get a fairly decent removal. Though we'll be bleeding from the dura of the dorsum, cella. Um, and that can sometimes be directly coagulated. And that's what you saw going on here. Um, and then I'll spend a little time with surgifoam, uh, getting the surgifoam in, putting a little tamponade on it, like you see here, and then irrigating it out again. And eventually we get uh, what I think is a good hemostasis and a decent resection. Um, and the goal being obviously to, uh, to get this type of appearance here. This, what, what you see here is fat. Uh, there's an opening from on the dura from where my cursor is here to where it is here. The stalk is beginning to descend. Uh, there may be a little tiny remnant of tumor uh, superiorly, but obviously not very much. We'll have to look at this over here on the right side, because this could be tumor that has gone through the wall of the cavernous sinus. And, and we'll get a, a scan at three months. We'll see how that's doing and follow this closely. So this is a fairly typical case. It was done with a team that was not as experienced on the ENT side, but you work with a whole variety of surgeons. And uh, one of the things that works well is if you communicate during the surgery to help them improve their skills and to expose it the way you want it to be exposed and to move the way you need it to be moved. Uh, and you could see even between the beginning of this case and the end that she got much more comfortable uh, as time passed. And I feel like we got a decent resection there. Good, so uh, do you have any questions? Emily, Chi, Ray. Good. All right. 
Thank you. I think we can move on. All right, Alejandro, you can take over this fine conference. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I'll put it on presentation mode. And so hopefully you see my um, presentation. I'll be talking about spinal development and some associated disorders first. We'll talk about, I'm in presenter mode. Let me You're see if I can switch that. There we go. How's that? Um, so first we'll go over, you know, spinal development and some of the immediately uh, related disorders. And then we'll sort of circle back and talk about how some of the genes that are implicated in those early stages later go on to uh, play roles in, in disorders that we see at different stages of life. And uh, we'll look over some cases and um, we'll ask some questions. This is highly tailored, hope, hopefully as a good resource for board review since a lot of the residents will be taking boards in March. So just as a overview, you know, that development of um, the embryo, you know, starts with uh, initially um, ovulation and um, it's in the first days one through eight, uh, it's in the blastus, morula and blastus, blastus stage uh, before it implants. Um, it then forms a gastrula, which differentiates into the three uh, germ cell layers. And uh, your our CNS is uh, formed through neurulation, initially primarily neurulation, and then secondary neurulation, which we'll talk about some of the associated disorders. Um, I will basically these first slides show that there are a number of genes uh, associated with this initial development, which we'll circle back and we'll, we'll talk about some of the uh, associated disorders with uh, related to those genes. Uh, defects with gastrulation, that early stage where the uh, we get differentiation into the three germ layers include split cord, split cord malformations, neuroenteric dermoid and epidermoid cysts, anterior and posterior spina bifida, intestinal malrotation duplication of fistula, anterior meningocele, and other complex dysraphic malformations. For some of those who are in their board studying, um, maybe Emily, um, do you know what kind of split corn malformations these are on the right and left? So on the right here, um, it looks maybe like a type type one. I'm sorry, on the left, type one. Um, Diasto, uh, diastomatomyu. And then I think on uh, in one on the right um, is, uh, would be a type two, a diplomyelia. Uh, great, no, that's right. Um, the main difference here is the one on the left has two separate dural sacs. The one on the right has one dural sac, but the cord has split in one segment. And so, as you said, there's two types of split cord malformations. Uh, type one was formerly called diastomatomyelia, um, and it, it, it specifically has two dural sacs. Sometimes it has a bony ledge in between them. And split cord malformation type two, formerly called diplomyelia, um, usually has one dural sac uh, with a portion of the cord that is split. True dimyelia of note or complete duplication of a normal spinal cord has not been described. And clinically, uh, we often see tuft of, of hair, and these can indicate a split cord malformation. Um, here uh, in picture B, they point out a sacral dimple that is associated also with a fat, fatty phylum terminality. So um, beginning po post ovulation day 17, um, the median hinge point forms to begin folding the neural plate and to begin our process of primarily neurulation 
and the formation of the CNS. Um, there are additional bending points and uh, this begins sort of the elongation and differentiation of uh, the CNS. Uh, the anterior neural pore closes, um, you know, uh, around po post ovulation day 24. Uh, that varies slightly between resources, post ovulation day 25, and so forth. Um, and uh, this is this manifests as a thickening in the dorsal portion of the embryonic, uh, uh, in, in the dorsal portion of the embryonic lamina terminalis. This will essentially form our you know, cranial portion of our CNS. Um, and the anterior neuropore will then form the three primary buds that will form the brain, cerebellum, uh, brainstem. The caudal neuropore closes around post-ovulation day 26, and it corresponds to more distal portion of CNS uh, at the S2 level. And this is primary neurulation. Um, Defects of the dorsal ectoderm can involve any level in the neuroaxis, and they uh, form dermoid cyst, epidermoid cyst, or dermal sinuses. Uh, defects of the dorsal mesoderm um, turn into either intraspinal lipomas or lipomyelomeningoceles. Um, and um, this leads to either an open spinal dysraphism or a closed spinal dysraphism. Uh, open spinal dysraphism uh, have, don't have a skin lining over them, so they form myelomeningoceles. Um, Chi, what is uh, myelomeningoceles associated with higher up? Being shown in that picture as well. Um, like Chiari malformation? Chiari 2 specifically. Um, and then closed spinal dysraphism have a uh, skin overlying them. A, di a um, split core malformation is usually closed spinal dysraphism, but it can um, have an open component. Uh, so it's not always a slow, closed spinal dysraphism. Secondary neurulation uh, begins later, post ovulation day 25 to 27, and it forms the embryonic tail. So below S2. And uh, rather than a folding, it's more of a um, cavitation. Uh, and then defects involving the caudal cell mass or primitive prim streak lead to caudal agenesis, um, which range from partial to complete absence of the coccyx and sacrum. Um, all right, so I just want to circle back and you know, there are a lot of genes implicated in all the formation of, of um, the primary germ cells, layers, and then uh, the, C the various portions of the CNS. Here you see WINT1 um, as one of the genes um, which is heavily involved in the pre-gastrulation stage. And here in gastrulation, I want to point out hedgehog, which is involved in ventralization. Those two genes um, we see in a condition which uh, a, is divided into four groups. Um, and two of the groups um, uh, correlate to those genes, Wnt and Sonic Hedgehog. Um, and I'm wondering, maybe Halima, do you know what we're talking about here? Adiloplastoma. Yep, that's right. That's right. Good. So um, medulloblastoma is divided into these four groups, and they're thought to each derive from distinct um, cell uh, cells of origin. Do you know which one has the better prognosis, which one has the worst prognosis? The WNT1 has the uh, better prognosis. Mm -hmm. And which one has which the one worst prognosis? The G3 and the G4. Yep, G, yep. G, G3 is uh, commonly 
um, you know, thought to have the worst prognosis as, as seen down here in this, um, in this chart. So that is commonly asked. Staging is according to Chang's operative staging system based on whether you have any metastases, presence in the CNS, intracranial leptomeningeal spread, spinal leptomeningeal spread or metastases outside of the CNS. Um, we also, there was a gene um, um, involved in the pregastrulation stage named brachyuri, um, which is part of that same pathway as the Wnt gene. And uh, brachyuri, we see uh, commonly discussed uh, with another condition. So a, pa uh, a patient uh, shown in the scans below uh, is sent to your spinal clinic. And um, this uh, tumor uh, was biopsied and has strong brachyuri overexpression. Um, what, um, what, are you, what are you treating here, um, Alex? Can you? Uh, it's maybe chordoma. That's right. Um, chordomas um, uh, tend to occur in the sacrum. They also tend to occur in the clivus. Um, here is. Um, on the top, some images of an intracranial clival chordoma and on the bottom, sacral chordoma, uh, showing the various sequences um, and its appearance. Over in the CT, you can see how there are some calcified portions within it. And that's thought to be um, normal bone within it rather than uh, calcified uh, bits and pieces. So, um, Chordoma is a slow growing radio resistant tumor, but they're locally aggressive and invasive, highly recurrent, even um, seeding along the operative tract. Um, they're rare cancers. Uh, they tend to occur, their, their um, prevalence is sort of evenly split between the skull base, which tends to be the clivus, the mobile spine, and the sacrum. Uh, it makes up notably over 50% of the primary tumors of the sacrum. Peak incidence is mostly later in age, and they rarely occur in kids, but when they do, they can be encountered in children with tuberous sclerosis. Median survival is 6.29 years, so even though it is a benign tumor, it's so locally aggressive um, that uh, large wide excision is um, the primary uh, treatment when possible. Um, and there are, you know, limited chemo and radiation um, options for these tumors. They were first characterized uh, microscopically by Verkow, um, and he described these, uh, the pathology of it as, you know, these bubble-like vacuoles that he referred to as fissiliferous, so as like a papanomonic uh, pathology term for them. But Riber first introduced the term chordoma in the 1890s. Uh, Brandon, why do you think um, why do you think perhaps he introduced the term chordoma? And it has to do with its cell of origin. Because it, it comes from the the notochord. Yep, that's right. It's thought to uh, uh, derive from notochord remnants. Uh, three subtypes are recognized. Conventional chordoma is the most common. There's also chondroid chordoma that has the best prognosis. And the more poorly and de-differentiated chordomas are the least common, but they have the worst prognosis. They're also uh, associated with this smark b one gene homozygous deletion. Brachyuri uh, is also has also been implicated in a number of other cancers, um, just so you know, and it's usually its overexpression is, uh, correlates with worse prognosis. Um, going back to gastrulation, I also just want to um, point out the Hox gene. 
here, which is implicated in left and right symmetry. Um, and interestingly, lumbosacral transitional anatomy um, has, uh, there's uh, studies suggest that it has a genetic component involving the Hox genes. And mutations in these genes may play a role in the formation of the lumbosacral transitional vertebrae. Uh, lumbosacral transitional vertebrae are seen in about a quarter of people. Sacralization of L5 is much more common, about 17% of the population, while lumbarization of S1 is only about 2% of the population. And the prevalence is higher in men compared to women. And sacralization, the more common of the two, is more common in males while accessory L5-S1 articulations and lumbarization of S1 are more common in women. And um, low back pain in the presence of these uh, lumbosacral transitional vertebrae was originally noted by Mario Bertolotti and termed Bertolotti syndrome. Um, there is a Castell-V classification, um, which uh, classifies them primarily into three types uh, where Types A are unilateral, types B are bilateral. Um, type 1A is just a enlargement of the transverse process of at least 19 millimeters. Type 2 is an actual um, uh, pseudoarthrosis or pseudoarticulation. Uh, type 3 is a complete fusion of the transverse process to uh, the, the sacrum. And type 4 is a combination of type two on one side and type three on the other side. Um, going back to, sorry, going back to this gastrulation stage, we also see BMP, um, which is involved in dorsalization of um, our gastrula. Um, this has, that has been implicated in this condition. Um, this patient is referred to your clinic because of myelopathy. And um, what strikes you about these, the CT scan, Noah? Um, looks like the uh, posterior um, uh, ligament is severely ossified. Um, so this is consistent with OPLO. Yep, correct. Um, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament um, is attributed to proliferation differentiation of fibroblast-like chondrocytes and osteoblasts, which may be caused by overexpression of bone morphogenic proteins uh, in the ossified ligament. Uh, and so rather than um, well-organized fibers, you get this cartilaginous tissue with um, centers of hyal hyalinoid degeneration and ossification. Uh, OPLL also involves other genes, such as Col6A1, BMP transforming growth factor beta, others. Um, and it has been linked to other disorders of aberrant ossification and bone homeostasis uh, that we'll talk about briefly. Um, it can be divided into four different types based on whether it's continuous or segmental, mixed or localized, um, and it can cause various uh, degrees of symptoms. Um, on the other hand, uh, you referred this patient with a related condition um, to your clinic. Um, what, uh, what strikes you about his imaging, um, Trevor? Um, you can see it, see, uh, well, he's got tons of dish uh, anteriorly. He's got a uh, fracture um, at uh, C3-4 through that um, ossified anterior longitudinal ligament. Yeah, that's right. Um, so rather than PLL being ossified here, the ALL is um, severely ossified. And as you said, this is known as diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis or forestier disease, um, which is ossification of that ALL. And it, it involves the formation of these enthesopathies. Um, there's also, there uh, of note, there's no involvement of the secret iliac synovial joints in these patients. Um, and yeah, you mentioned an uh, a good finding at 3-4, which is an interruption of that. Um, uh, 
Um, sorry, I seem to be, let me go to this slide here. Um, and we'll talk about this in the, um, in the context of ankylosing spondylitis also, but since you mentioned it, there's almost like this Anderson formation, uh, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, let's say um, a patient is directed to your clinic with this similar hyperostosis and ossification of the cervical spine. She has this wide webbed neck. Um, what would you be, and she also has some other related comorbidities. She has deafness, um, perhaps a cleft palate. Um, oh. What might you be concerned about? Um, chi. I think given the um, fusions in a cervical spine and some of the other associated symptoms um, look like the clipophile syndrome. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, this is a clipophile, um, which most commonly presents as a sporadic mutation, but can have autosomal dominant inheritance as well as autosomal recessive inheritance, depending on which genes are implicated um, it can be caused by mutations in GDF6 or GDF3 genes, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. Um, and these GDFs are members of the bone morphogenic protein family. When it's caused by mutations in the MEOX1 gene, it's inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. Um, several other genes are linked to clipophile, including Hox genes. SGM1 and PAX1. There are several classification systems uh, summarized in, in, in the table. Um, very good. So um, the next patient you see in your clinic, it has um, a, a particular um, form of hyperostosis with this morphology. Uh, and they have a couple other findings. Um, Emily, what are, can you um, run us through these scans? Sure. So, um, got lower left image, um, uh, definitely seeing um, just this like overall straightening um, of the, uh, I think it's probably thoracic spine um, with uh, just not a lot of, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just straight between the vertebral bodies and the uh, and the, the discs. Um, on the uh, left upper, uh, I see a cervical and thoracic uh, sagittal CT. Um, notable for it's a a straightening of the of of a uh, lordosis and. Looks like it's infusion on uh, C2 and C3. Um, then the right lower, uh, it's a pelvic x-ray. Um, I think it's... I agree with uh, everything you're saying. Do you know what condition this patient might have? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very likely enclosing spondylitis. I think the biggest giveaway is the is the bamboo spine on the uh, that left lower panel? Um, perfect. Yeah, that's the textbook term to sort of describe um, this uh, appearance of the spine, where all the various segments have fused together, um, creating this bamboo appearance um, on the upper right. Um, do we, Brandon? Do you know what what this image is showing. Looks like a epidural uh, lipomatosis. 
Okay. Well, I didn't show you some of the other sequences that might help you differentiate that. Um, but this is actually showing dural ectasia. So it's like a, an enlargement of the dural sac. Um, and down on the bottom right, this is showing you a, a, a x-ray of the sacrum and, and pelvis, at least the right SI joint. And you basically don't see an SI joint. It's fused. Um, and this is central to ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, it, it, it's fairly common, affects one in 200 individuals. Um, and uh, it often um, occurs with other peripheral arthritis. Um, it can also occur with uh, uniocular anterior uveitis that can be treated with corticosteroid drops. Um, these patients also have a risk of developing apical pulmonary fibrosis as well as aortic valve incompetence. Um, and um, they usually develop late in the course and are often asymptomatic. Um, also poor osteopenia and osteoporosis commonly occurs uh, with these patients that increases their risk of vertebral fracture. Um, ankylosing spondylitis has a strong association to HLA B27. Um, and as, as, as mentioned, um, it often involves the sacroiliac joint um, and uh, causes um, the sacroiliitis and eventual fusion of the joint. Um, so a pelvic x-ray or MRI is often um, used. As you can see here on the right, we have some of the diag diagnostic criteria and the sacroiliitis um, is a, um, a strong supporter of ankylosing spondylitis. Um, patients create these syndesmophytes, which are different than osteophytes. Um, rather than you know this, this degeneration and sclerosing of the end plates, you get um, what, what are called these Romanus lesions. And in early disease, you can see that sometimes in x-ray. Um, as this sort of um, lightening, lightening of the of the of the tips of the end plates, which then over time sort of fuse together um, with the adjacent vertebral segment, and this creates one big fusion body in the spine. Um, and as mentioned, you know these patients are at high risk for fracture, and um, they often develop these fractures seen here, which are termed carotid. Uh, carrot stick fractures. Maybe you can just imagine a carrot snapping. Um, and sometimes these stress fractures heal over time to form these Anderson, Anderson lesions. Um, so we, we talked about dural ectasia and dural ectasia is associated with a number of syndromes and disorders from Marfan or Ehlers-Danlos connective tissue diseases to NF1, ankylosing spondylitis, oste osteogenesis and perfecta, trauma, uh, post-surgery. Um, so let's say that you get a patient in your clinic who is referred to you for scoliosis. Uh, you can see on the bottom left has a really severe uh, scoliosis. It's surely notable um, externally. Um, and even though this is not uh, a picture of this same patient, uh, your patient has these similar spots as well seen on the upper picture. And you notice some, uh, a particular appearance in their eyes. And they also have um, these associated findings. Um, Halima, um, what, what, are, what, are, what, are some, what are some of these findings? So the... The skin pigmentation in the middle panel uh, looks like cafe olive spots. Um, and then the eye findings um, look like uh, pigmentation in the um, iris. So um, it could be like these nodules. And then it seems like on the cat scan, uh, vision has an uh, optic um, uh, Tumor optic, a tumor optic nerve could be an optic glioma, and then on the bottom panel, uh, also has dual ectasias, um, as you showed uh, in the previous slide. So, overall vision, um, could have uh, NF1. 
Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, and I'll try to go quickly because I think we're we're uh, out of time, but that's exactly right. And F1 or von Recklinghaus's disease, which is our somal dominant, with uh, implicates the NF1 gene in chromosome 17 and the neurofibromin gene uh, tumor suppressor gene. Um, and these are cafe au lait spots seen here. These um, are uh, skin cutaneous neurofibromas. These are Lish nodules. You pointed out the optic glioma. Um, and these patients often, uh, or they can have sphenoid dysplasia as well, uh, which can also be seen in this CT scan. Um, as mentioned here, um, these are just pictures of neurofibromas. Um, we recently had a patient on the spine team um, who had these lesions. Um, and the various findings here, um, uh, there's a meningocele as well. Um, and this is just scalloping of the vertebral body seen on x-ray, both posteriorly and then anteriorly here. Now you are referred this patient uh, with a, um, which has two, two different patients that you see back to back and uh, one at the top um, with these large lesions uh, next to the spine and intracranially. And then this patient with one spinal lesion and um, these two sort of pathognomonic lesions intracranially. Chi, what, what uh, do you have to suspect in these patients? I think looking at a scan at the bottom right, um, looks like uh, potentially bilateral uh, vestibular short um, That would make me think about NF2. Perfect. So NF2, also autosomal dom dominant uh, with uh, the NF2 gene on chromosome 22. It implicates the Merlin tumor suppressor gene uh, and bilateral vestibular schwannomas are pathognomonic for it. Uh, so that gives your diagnosis, um, quick review of the uh, pathology of the schwannoma. You know, you see the school of fish and then the Antony B and Antony A um, uh, portions of it where Antony B is sort of this loose, uh, on the right-hand image, the left part of the image, and the Antony A are these tightly uh, packed um, cells. And Baroque bodies seen here. Uh, and then meningiomas, um, you know, there's many different types of meningiomas with um, various pathological findings, but they commonly have somoma bodies and whorls. Um, and just quickly to um, go over tuberous sclerosis or Burnerville disease, it's also autosome dominant. Either the TSC1 gene or the TSC2 gene um, implicates the mTOR pathway. Um, uh, Emily, do you know what mTOR stands for? Um, it's a signaling pathway. Um, uh, the M is mechanistic and then target of uh, rapamycin. That's right. So it's it's the the medicine that targets it um, is in the name of the gene. So rapamycin or serolimus um, or it's uh, 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 or everolimus are used as as medical treatment for tuberous sclerosis. Um, can have these various findings. Um, we here you can see cortical tubers. Uh, SEGA, as well as um, cutaneous angiofibromas. You can also have subungual angiofibromas seen in the left lower image, chagrin patches, which is left upper image, ash leaf spots, or adenoma sebation, which is, are these cutaneous angiofibromas. Um, uh, last question. Um, Emily, do you looking at these set of images, do you know what this patient might have and what you might expect this spinal lesion to be? Um, so in particular looking um, uh, at the appearance, it's pretty uh, heterogeneously enhancing um, in the cord as well. and then there'll also be cerebellar lesions, um, multiple lesions, um, looks like in the, um, Kidney as well, all this together, I think there are likely these multiple hemangioblastomas um, that you'd expect to see um, yep. mm -hmm. in, uh, in DHL. Perfect. Yep. So you see this um, large heterogeneous cerebellar tumor 
uh, along with liver cysts or pancreatic cysts and liver cysts. Um, and you see a spinal lesion, which uh, based on this, um, uh, all putting all this together in its entirety, you can expect to uh, likely be a hemangioblastoma as part of VHL, which is our somal dominant and chrom implicates chromosome three. Um, it can uh, have cerebellar uh, hemangioblastomas, which are were um, historically termed Lindau's tumor. It can also involve retinal um, hemangioblastomas, which were historically termed von Hippel's tumor, as well as kidney pancreatic cyst, kidney cancer. Um, so great job, everybody. Um, that's all I have. And thank you very much. Hope that helps for the boards. Nice job, Alejandro. This is a good, good board review of high yield topics. All right. So today we have uh, one of our new, newer, newish faculty members, Dr. Travis Caton, who is uh, an assistant professor of neurosurgery and specifically specializes in neurointerventional surgery. He did his training first MD at Columbia followed by radiology residency at Brigham and Women's in Boston, and then a diagnostic neuroradiology fellowship at UCSF. Um, he specializes in treating all vascular disorders of the head and neck and endovascularly, including stroke aneurysms, fistulas, uh, beam sinus stenosis, carotid stenosis. Uh, and he has done a significant amount of clinical and translational research uh, throughout training. And today we'll be talking to us about uh, pulsatile tinnitus. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. Sir, let me uh, bring up my screen here. All right. Am I in presenter mode, or can you see my my slides normally? Slides are good. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Really excited um, to talk about this topic, sort of an unusual one, pulsatile tinnitus. Um, we're gonna talk about sort of current state of the art in uh, proposed pathogenesis, diagnosis, and treatment of this condition. So I have no disclosures. And our learning objectives you know, in this talk will be to understand a differential diagnosis for both vascular and non-vascular pulsatile tinnitus and to understand the complementary role of non-invasive imaging and invasive neuroangiographic studies in the diagnosis and ultimately treatment of pulsatile tinnitus. So I wanna start off with an anecdote here. This is a young Edgar Allan Poe, uh, whose one of his most famous stories is the telltale heart. And in this story, the narrator uh, describes uh, a sensation of guilt that progresses through the dialogue as he perceives a sound in his ear which corresponds to a heartbeat. And as you go through the story, there's some really elegant descriptions of what we would now call pulsatile tinnitus. So the narrator describes a sound that's not external, it's an internal perception. And as the story progresses, the sound progresses and the psychological impact of that sound really drives the narrator uh, insane to the point where he ultimately confesses his crime. And there's some really, really interesting descriptions of what it's like to have pulsatile tinnitus in this story. And they really are very similar to what patients describe when we talk to them in clinic. Edgar Allan Poe himself has been speculated to suffer from pulsatile tinnitus. People think that the narrator in the story uh, represents Poe and his own battle with pulsatile tinnitus. And his death is still the subject of mystery, but there is speculation that he himself suffered from pulsatile tinnitus and may have been driven uh, to suicide uh, by that. Obviously, that's speculative, but there's a clear impact of pulsatile tinnitus on mental health. And as borne out in the literature today, we know that patients with pulsatile tinnitus have very high rates of depression. Perhaps more concerningly, they also have high rates of suicidal ideation, higher rates of suicide, and perhaps most concerningly of all, that suicide in these patients tends to occur. Uh, temporally in relationship to the onset of their pulsatile tinnitus. Beyond the mental health aspects of the disease, there are significant other clinical morbidities that can occur. So 
we know that approximately 14% of patients with PT, as we'll call it, uh, harbor some underlying arterial or arteriovenous lesion, which puts them at risk of stroke, either ischemic or hemorrhagic. Apart from that population, a significant number of these patients have idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which can lead to papilledema and progress to permanent vision loss. Uh, that goes to say that beyond this, the sort of psychosocial impact of PT, it can actually uh, carry other significant morbidity, and it's not always a benign, a nuisance condition. Pulsatal tinnitus is hard to estimate the true prevalence, but we know that up to 5 million Americans have tinnitus, and we estimate that somewhere between 4 and 10% have pulsatal tinnitus. So that would be somewhere between 100 and 500,000 Americans. The community of pulsatal tinnitus, the patient community, is very active. Um, and engages with each other and shares their stories. There's a website called Wooshers, uh, named after the whooshing sound that these patients experience, where patients share their stories, often their frustrations with the medical system and their misdiagnosis, but also their victories when their tinnitus is diagnosed. And I really encourage you to visit the website to sort of understand uh, the patient community and, and learn about what they go through and how they interact with the healthcare system. The challenge of pulsatile tinnitus is that it's sort of left in the gray area between a number of medical silos right now. So ENT, neurovascular specialist like us, psychiatry and neurology, there's really no true home for this chief complaint. What ends up happening to these patients is they end up in one of these referral bases, they end up getting shifted back forth through the different groups. And there's never really crosstalk between the groups to come up with unifying diagnosis and treatment. And what I would argue in this talk, what I'll try to show is that I think that neurovascular specialists can really be the nucleus uh, for a multidisciplinary approach to this condition. So it's important to define what pulsatile tinnitus is and what it isn't. A good contemporary definition is that it is the perception of sound or noise that is synchronous to the heartbeat. That is to distinguish it from non-pulsatile tinnitus, which is continuous and carries a very different uh, pathogenesis, etiology, and management. Again, today we're focusing strictly on pulsatile tinnitus. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about the current thoughts on pathophysiology and the differential diagnosis. First question we have to ask is what causes pulsatile tinnitus fundamentally? Okay. I think one sort of cohesive definition is that it's an abnormal blood flow pattern transmission to the cochlea. So that can be either from abnormal blood flow generation or abnormal transduction of that blood flow pattern to the cochlea and perhaps an interaction of those two factors. When we think about it sort of diagnostically, we have to have a structured approach. And there are several different ways to sort of come up with a conceptual framework for pulsive tinnitus. But the most classic first hierarchy way to differentiate it is into objective or subjective tinnitus. Uh, that is objective, something that can be perceived by an examiner, either through auscultation or other maneuvers. Subjective tinnitus being something that only the patient perceives despite any sort of uh, physical or uh, diagnostic tool. We then think about a structure, uh, diagnostic approach. We bucket things as vascular, structural, or sort of systemic etiologies. And then when it comes to making decisions about treatment, we have to think, of course, is this a dangerous condition or something that's benign? And we can reassure patients. That distinction is very important. Uh, even if you don't offer treatment, being able to tell a patient their tinnitus is not the source of something harmful is very important for their well-being. So the differential is very, very broad, and that's why this disease is very challenging for all of us. Um, the structural causes include tumors, most notably paragangliomas. It also includes structural abnormalities of the temporal bone, the hissance of the sigmoid plate, semicircular canal, and otospongiosis, among others. Systemic conditions include medications, neurological conditions such as myoclonus, and then high flow states, including anemia and cardiac disease. But obviously, we're going to focus on vascular causes. Those include venous disorders, arterial disorders, and arterial venous shunting. One arterial cause that I think deserves a little bit of attention is fibromuscular dysplasia. I mention that because it's something we see almost daily, if certainly weekly, in the angio suite. Fibromuscular dysplasia has a sort of a pathognomonic angiographic appearance, more often occurs in women. In a recent study of an FMD registry in the United States, the prevalence of PT in this population was. 37%, which is far higher than a standard population and begs the question as to how and why that occurs. They know in this study that on a physical exam, the patients who had 
postal tinnitus and fibromuscular dysplasia more often had carotid breweries. So the speculation is that the arterial wall abnormality produces some sort of turbulent flow that's transmitted to the carotid artery at the level of the petrous bone producing the tinnitus. Arterial venous fistulas, of course, are the sort of most intuitive cause of postural tinnitus. They're not the most common, but this is clearly due to transmission of arterial pressure and blood flow patterns to the veins. PT may be one of the presenting symptoms in up to 90% of patients with transverse sinus fistulas. It's also very common in fistulas of the uh, skull base, including marginal sinus and condylar canal. On the images here, you see as a patient with a, a hypoglossal canal fistula that I treated as a fellow. And this patient's only presenting symptom and only symptom at all was pulsable tinnitus. And that brings me to the final point here, which is that PT may be the only presenting symptom in up to 14% of dural fistulas. So when you have a patient with PT, that may be the only sign or symptom they're gonna present with uh, for a dural fistula, which could potentially be high risk for hemorrhage. So going back to the pathophysiology, presumably an arteriovenous fistula creates pulsatile tinnitus through increased um, uh, pressure, turbulence, and stress along the venous uh, wall. One moment here. And the shunted blood uh, then must result in the transmission of this arterial pulse to the cochlea. That seems more straightforward, but in venous pulsatile tinnitus, it's a little bit less clear. Working along the same lines of what we think causes arterial venous shunting tinnitus, uh, we have to infer that something is causing there to be increased pressure, wall shear stress, and turbulence in the veins. So we'll go through what might cause that. But first, we have to sort of think about what normal venous flow uh, looks like. So unfortunately, there are very few studies of normal dural venous flow uh, in control patients, but of the ones we, we have, we have several sort of theories as to what that flow should look like. Essentially, it should be laminar or non-turbulent. There should be minimal pressure, pressure gradients all the way from superior sagittal sinus to right atrium. And the wall shear stress should be nearly homogeneous throughout, with maybe a few exceptions. One study from my old group in San Francisco looked at 10 controls and found no abnormal flow jets or rotational flow in control patients. This is an example of a flow model of a, a control. A more recent study uh, found similar normal uh, velocity and flow patterns in control patients. What they did notice was that there is one area that tends to have a little bit higher wall stress on the superior aspect of the distal transverse sinus. And they infer that that's sort of a normal offloading point for wall shear stress um, in normal physiology. But that's again, very small compared with what we'll see shortly. Venous sinus stenosis is uh, far and away the most common uh, venous cause of pulsatile tinnitus. There's unfortunately no consensus definition of this. It's very hard to measure and define. It's dynamic. It's largely classified as extrinsic or intrinsic. Intrinsic causes of stenosis would be something like clot or an arachnoid granulation, whereas extrinsic stenosis would be due to typically elevated intracranial pressure, which results in that ribbon-like smooth tapering of uh, the venous sinus that we see in IIH. Some people define it by a pressure gradient. There's various cutoffs. Eight millimeters mercury is one that's commonly used. But again, this is a common finding in asymptomatic patients, but it's much more common in patients with pulsatile tinnitus. And it's extremely common and almost characteristic of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Flow models show that these stenoses really do result in increased velocity and post-stenotic turbulence in accordance with sort of Bernoulli's law. And that's what we think is a primary generator of tinnitus in this uh, pathology. A related pathology is something called a sigmoid sinus diverticulum, which used to be called venous aneurysm of the sigmoid sinus. These are uh, focal outpouchings at the transverse sigmoid junction. Um, they look almost aneurysmal, hence the name. These uh, have been proposed to be a repository for that post-stenotic turbulent flow. And because they project right into the mastoid air cells, it's believed that that turbulence within this diverticulum is transmitted more directly to the cochlea. Continuing down the drovian sinus is the jugular bulb. High riding jugular bulb slash diverticulum is sort of a spectrum of the same pathology. 
Now this occurs right at the jugular foramen. Uh, here you can see an example from the literature of a normal jugular bulb versus a high riding jugular bulb. This has been associated with pulsal tinnitus as well, but it's very common in asymptomatic patients. Flow models have looked at controls and patients with these so-called high riding jugular bulbs. And basically what they show is that the pattern of blood flow, the velocity of a fluid through the uh, high riding jugular bulb basically takes longer and results in more turbulence and sort of a helical, helical pattern of turbulence within the jugular bulb that's not seen in patients with so-called normal anatomy. So that brings me to sort of the next cause, what I'll call a venous etiology of pulse of tinnitus, but this was conventionally thought of as a completely separate entity. That's sigmoid sinus wall abnormalities. These are basically dehiscences, loss of cortical covering of the sigmoid sinus and or the jugular bulb, resulting in contact of the vein with the mastoid air cells and or the cochlea. Uh, this has an extremely strong correlation with intracranial hypertension, and more recent studies have suggested that it may actually be caused by pathologic venous flow rather than a separate and independent entity. So what you can see here, the blue uh, dural sinus model, uh, the white part of it is the area of focal bony dehiscence, cortical dehiscence, and what they showed is that in flow models, those areas of cortical dehiscence co-localize almost exactly to areas of abnormal uh, venous pressure. So we're sort of creating a story here where stenosis leads to turbulence, leads to diverticula, leads to bony remodeling, bony thinning. All of these things are sort of in the same spectrum. Now, how do these relate to intracranial hypertension? We know that in intracranial hypertension, CSF drainage, CSF diversion improves uh, clinical symptoms, headaches, uh, papilledema. But what we've learned more recently is that CSF drainage actually also improves venous sinus stenosis measurably. This was a study done at UCSF where they took a patient with IIH and did imaging before and after a lumbar puncture. And what they showed was that not only did the venous sinus stenosis caused by an arachnoid granulation improve on an immediate MRI after the lumbar puncture, this was a large volume uh, lumbar puncture, but the caliber of the vein also improved as did the pressure gradient and the velocity patterns. So this sort of provides a mechanistic link between ICP, CSF pressure, and pulse of tinnitus. So what we have here is sort of a complex story of interactions between the venous system, the skull, and the CSF pressure. And they communicate and interact with each other in a way that is normal in certain patients and somehow reaches a pathologic feedback loop in other patients, wherein CSF pressure causes stenosis, causes pathologic flow, causes bony remodeling, et cetera, leading to these various causes of venous pulsatile tinnitus. So now I'm gonna go through sort of a diagnostic approach to pulsatile tinnitus, including neuroimaging and endovascular diagnostics. But first, I think it's important to look at the epidemiology. Older studies of PT identified venous causes as the uh, plurality as a source of pulsatile tinnitus, but a much more recent study uh, from NYU uh, came to a sort of a similar conclusion, but a different interpretation. Uh, uh, they identified venous sinus stenosis as the most common cause of pulsatile tinnitus of over a third in their population of over 200 patients. Whereas in the 2008 study, which is from the ENT literature, it was about 3%. So did something really change here or are we just changing the way we understand the disease? And I think it's the latter. We're really recognizing that venous sinus stenosis is the underlying cause in what was previously labeled uh, independent uh, bony disorders. In our own experience at UCSF, we looked at 164 patients who went to the angio suite for evaluations. This is a filtered group of patients who had high suspicion for vascular PT. And what we found was that with proper diagnostic workup, we were able to identify a source of pulsatile tinnitus in about 75% of these patients. We were able to rule out the vascular cause in the other 24%. Of the patients with a vascular cause, about half had a venous etiology, 20% had an AV shunt, 7% had an arterial cause. But the most important, I think, takeaway from this study was that 14% of patients in this population had a PT mechanism that put them at a higher risk for either intracranial hemorrhage or ischemic stroke. So again, PT is not a benign nuisance. It can be a symptom of a dangerous underlying uh, pathophysiology. 
in working up these patients, a good clinical history is important. You want to get an idea of the onset of the pulsatile tinnitus, the severity. You can use a simple zero to 10 VAS. The laterality can help you localize the tinnitus and the pitch can be very helpful. I'm going to see if I can play an audio clip of So this is a patient with an arterial venous fistula. You hear a crescendo, decrescendo whistling. Very characteristic of an arterial venous shunt, whereas this is a patient with venous sinus stenosis. It's a much sort of gentler, I think Travis, lower pitch. Oh, you can't hear it? I think oh no. If you have your headphones on, it might be going in your headphones. Yeah, try replaying. Can you hear now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, try playing it now. Sorry, now we lost audio on you. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Let's try this one more time. Sorry about that. Here we go. All right, there's your fistula. And this is a venous sinus stenosis. So these were actually published on wooshers.com by patients um, using their own iPhones to record their sounds. So we can actually get much higher quality uh, representations of the sounds using uh, uh, canal uh, microphones as a new technology. It's important in these patients to also establish the impact of PT on their quality of life. There are a number of uh, instruments you can use, and it's important to establish this to guide your own treatment effect and follow up your patients. The one that I think is the best is called the tinnitus functional index. It's brief, well-validated, reproducible, and good, robust to measuring treatment effect. It also correlates with older uh, PT questionnaires that were used in the past. And it's important because it assesses several domains um, of the impact on quality of life. In terms of physical exam, uh, auscultation has gone by the wayside due to neuroimaging in many cases, but it really helps build a relationship with patients if you listen and try to understand their tinnitus. And you'd be surprised you can actually hear bruise and hear the tinnitus uh, more often than you would expect. And that really gives patients a sense of validation and trust that you really care about their condition. In terms of physical exam maneuvers, the most common maneuvers are designed to increase or reduce uh, jugular venous flow to identify that as a venous source. So if you compress the jugular vein or turn your head toward the side of tinnitus and the tinnitus improves, you're basically redirecting blood down the contralateral jugular vein, reducing blood down the symptomatic side. If this tinnitus improves, that suggests that the vein, there, A, that there's a venous cause and B, that it's ipsilateral to the side you're compressing. Conversely, if the tinnitus worsens with compression of the, tinnitus, of the symptomatic side, it suggests a contralateral venous etiology because you're redirecting flow to the contralateral side. Valsalva is also a non-specific technique, but changes in tinnitus from Valsalva also suggest a venous etiology. There's actually reasonable data that the jugular compression technique is very helpful. And some people suggest that it has a sensitivity and specificity approaching 80, 90% for delineating a venous cause of pulsatile tinnitus. So it's, it's very, very helpful in the clinic in differentiating venous from non-venous pulsatile tinnitus. Audiologic testing is helpful as a baseline uh, through EMT, 
This includes standard testing, as well as something called trans-canal recording, which I was alluding to earlier. Rather than putting an iPhone by your mastoid process, they put a small microphone that's dampened into the ear and measure directly the sound in your external auditory canal. And you can create these frequency maps here, which correlate with the sound patients here. And it also correlates with treatment effect. So that's one way of objectively measuring your the impact of your treatment on a patient's pulsatal tinnitus. It's also important to identify conductive hearing loss, which generally indicates enhanced perception of sound, can be seen in otospongiosis, and sensory neural hearing loss, which could cue you into the presence of a tumor. Again, it's important to try the best you can to identify the patient's sound because identifying the pulsatal tinnitus that's been told it's in the patient's head really helps you build rapport and trust with that patient. All patients who have any suspicion for IIH in this population should undergo a workup for the modified dandy criteria for IIH. That includes a lumbar puncture, and it should also include a formal neuroplomologic assessment, including a fun fundoscopic exam and perimetry. As Dr. Bederson alluded to in the chair's corner, many of these patients won't actually perceive their vision loss um, until it's too late. Automated perimetry can identify uh, subclinical vision loss and help you uh, steer the patient towards treatment and potentially prevent uh, permanent vision loss, which can happen in a matter of weeks in fulmin and IIH. So this is my approach to neuroimaging PT. It's an MR-based approach that I used uh, at UCSF as a fellow. It consists of seven sequences on MR. This was built over years, and it's tailored specifically for the evaluation of pulsatile tinnitus. It includes a 3D uh, T1 sequence, a diffusion weighted image, three dimensional flare, time of flight MRI, MRA, an arterial spin labeling sequence, and something called a TRIX, which is a time resolved contrast kinetics sequence, essentially functions like a MR angiogram where you visualize flow in the arterial and venous phase. And then most importantly, I think, is a uh, gradient 3D T1 fat titrated post consciousness. There's a lot of neuroradiology jargon, but Notice we don't have MR venography on here. We use post-contrast T1-weighted sequences to look at the drill sinuses. We find it to be much more reliable than conventional MR venography. So in terms of your differential diagnosis, the temporal bone CT is the diagnostic tool of choice for patients with any sort of auditory abnormality and will identify the bony structures far better than MRI. But I would argue that MRI and MRA in this protocol really hits all the rest of the differential and is therefore more effective as an initial imaging modality. The strengths are that it's very sensitive for venous pathology, shunts, and arterial disease, as well as tumors. It can be done in about 25 minutes and it doesn't have any radiation. The disadvantages are obviously evaluation of the bones and middle ear and inner ear structures. It requires 3T scanner and some specialized sequencing and protocoling, which can take additional work. This is an example of ASL, arterial spin labeling here, showing, uh, arterialized spin in the jugular uh, bulb and also the uh, transverse sinus. Those were all patients who were found to have dural fistulas. And this is an example of the trick sequence, which is a really beautiful evaluation of the entire uh, venous anatomy, again, using a contrast enhanced uh, sequence. And this is a patient with Eagle syndrome, impingement of the jugular veins by uh, venous Eagle syndrome by the styloid processes. So the endovascular workup for pulsatile tinnitus for me includes diagnostic arteriography to look at shunting and the global venous sinus dominance. It also includes venography and venous manometry. So venous manometry involves measuring pressures at different points throughout the dural venous sinuses and measuring pressure gradients. This is a template I use um, that's very, very comprehensive and basically identifies any source within the dural venous sinuses that could potentially be a site of a pressure gradient. For patients who have really conflicting causes of pulsatile tinnitus, some patients will benefit from something called a venous balloon test occlusion, which I'll talk about. That can help troubleshoot and localize the sound generator on the venous side. When we do this with patients, we ask them to score their pulsatile tinnitus zero to 10 as we do the balloon test throughout the dural venous sinuses, and we look for changes. With a patient being blinded, to where the balloon is at any given time. So it has to be a very objective test. So the concept of the venous balloon test occlusion is that 
we inflate a balloon at different points in the venous sinuses to look for stenoses, but also structural abnormalities like diverticulum. And unfortunately, we don't have test characteristics to know the sensitivity and specificity. I would think that the specificity is fairly high. I think the sensitivity is probably fairly low. But when you're troubleshooting a difficult case, it can be very useful. So if you have pulsatile tinnitus on one side with a sinus stenosis, you inflate a balloon in the contralateral transverse sinus, you're effectively redirecting flow through the stenosis. You would expect a patient to report an increase in their tinnitus during the examination. That's one example of how this could be used. Another would be if you had contralateral conflicting uh, potential sources of tinnitus and you weren't sure which was the cause. In that case, you can inflate the balloon at different places and ask the patient to report differences to determine which lesion you might treat. This is an example of a patient who had a jugular bulb diverticulum on one side, but a transverse stenosis on the other side. The patient's tinnitus got much worse when the balloon was inflated in panel D in the left-sided uh, transverse sinus because flow was directed through the stenosis and resulted in increased condylar venous flow. That helped us identify that the jugular diverticulum was likely not a cause of that patient's tinnitus. So treatment approaches. In general, with the proper diagnosis, in our experience at UCSF, we could be pretty successful in treating pulsatile tinnitus endovascularly. In the case of AV fistulas, we had a greater than 95% long-term durable resolution of PT. For patients with IH and venous sinus stenosis, still a very good long durable result in pulsatile tinnitus. The key is identifying and diagnosing uh, and selecting your patients properly. So this is a treatment algorithm we used. Uh, suspected vascular PT should always be assessed for a lesion that could potentially cause a stroke, ischemic or hemorrhagic. That obviously should be treated uh, immediately. With no stroke risk, the next question you ask, is there any chance this patient could have IAH? If there is any chance at all, you should diagnose it, work it up, start with medical management. If the patients fail, then they're candidates for stenting. If they don't have IAH, you need to determine with the patient if the PT is debilitating. If the PT is debilitating and it's a benign cause, they need to understand the risks and benefits of potential treatment. If it's tolerable, they may be reassured by knowing that it's not something potentially harmful. They might be okay with observation. Venous sinus stenting is the most well-described treatment. There are several flow models that show that venous sinus stenting restores that uh, physiologic flow across the stenosis. And one prospective study shows extremely high rates of PT resolution. And this is in patients who were treated just for PT, not for IIH. This is an example of a venous sinus stenosis with a stent deployed and a resolution of the normal caliber. Embolization of venous structures is also described. The sigmoid sinus diverticulum was first reported in 2000 by the French in a patient with debilitating PT uh, who was found to have this large venous diverticulum. They treated it like an aneurysm and found the patient got remarkably better. And that really sort of brought the concept of treating these as a source of pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, mastoid emissary veins can develop often in IAH when they course along the uh, mastoid air cells, they can be a generator of PT. These are much more ambiguous. In the case reports, they're always successful, but in one series where there were a number of failures, they basically concluded that these are common incidental findings, but you really need to localize them um, as the cause before you uh, offer treatment. The treatment risk is low, but you don't want to treat something that's not the cause of PT. The most challenging Lesion is probably jugular bulb abnormalities. These are these lesions right at the jugular bulb. They're essentially like wide neck type aneurysms in terms of morphology. These are classically treated with surgical remodeling, but there are many reports now of coiling of these lesions, often with balloon assistance or even stents. There's even one report of a web device used to treat one of these lesions with good results. I would caution though that putting stents near the jugular bulb uh, has historically carried high risk for stent migration. Um, not for this indication, but for others, the stent can migrate into the jugular vein and ultimately into the right heart, which can be a catastrophic complication. So this is something you want to undertake with significant caution. This is an example of a stent coiled jugular bulb diverticulum. Non-surgical therapies, largely from the non-PT literature, include tinnitus retraining therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
These have all been studied in general PT with randomized trials. They're all fairly effective. Transcranial magnetic stimulation may not have a long lasting effect, but this is a, a good resource for patients who don't have a treatable cause. Uh, that 25% in our population that we don't ever find a treatable cause, but the patients are still debilitating. So in summary, we sort of went through the differential diagnosis of vascular PT. We talked about one concept of pathogenesis of venous PT and its relationship with structural abnormalities and CSF pressure. We discussed a sort of diagnostic approach to PT, including a neuroendovascular evaluation. And I talked about a few treatments that are, can be offered. And then my conclusions here are that PT is, has major adverse effects on mental health and may uh, indicate an underlying dangerous lesion. So it's an important chief complaint to take seriously. Venus PT is likely the most prevalent subtype. The diagnosis is very challenging. It often takes persistence and an organized systematic approach. Endovascular treatments are likely effective in many, many cases but a multidisciplinary approach is really best for patients. What I showed here was a PubMed search in JNAS for pulsatile tinnitus. And you can see the increase over time in articles talking about pulsatile tinnitus, which I think reflects the shift towards our subspecialty in uh, being the nucleus for care for these patients. And I think that will continue to increase over time. So with that, I want to thank everybody here at Mount Sinai, uh, the Department of Neurosurgery, my whole team for welcoming me to the department. It's been a great experience, and uh, it's really an honor to be part of, of such an incredible group. Uh, I want to thank my, my crew from UCSF um, who trained me, and also specifically Dr. Amons and Dr. Meisel, who established the Pulse Little Tinders Clinic at UCSF now almost a decade ago, and were really drivers in teaching me to think critically about the veins, but also about how to interact with and think about these patients with pulsive tinnitus critically. And uh, with that, I'll uh, open up for any questions. Thank you, Travis. That was by far the best presentation on this topic that I have ever heard. And uh, uh, it's just fantastic. I have so many ideas of how we can help you build this uh, in the New York area. And um, uh, I just think it was great. Uh, I would just like to ask residents, what was your favorite part of Travis's talk? Frank, what was your favorite favorite slide? Why were we um, the high risk of putting in venous stents? Um, you know, uh, seems like a very, very high risk of complication if it migrates to the heart, like you said. Um, you know, I kind of like the, uh, I guess the danger of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's my favorite part. Halima, what was your favorite slide? Wait, can I make a comment on that real quick? This is Jay. First of all, Frank, I think that's really, uh, an insightful comment <laughs> and, uh, the other uh, aspect is, I, I do want to say that this is a field that's been growing and changing. It was a general comment. Um, and actually, what we've learned in recent years is that it's it's not high risk. Um, it's really become, so I, I'm not sure. I didn't take that from Travis's, but maybe it's because of my background knowledge that I have. So maybe there was, maybe, maybe I was influencing the way I was interpreting what he was saying. And just so the audience knows, we actually know it's very not high risk. In fact, this is unpublished data yet, but it will be published as part of an FDA prospective you know, core lab and independent adjudicated trial uh, that the complication risk was essentially zero in a, in a, in a prospective trial like this of, I can't remember, it was like 48 patients or 50 something patients. Um, one patient had a GI bleed from the aspirin and plavix, which was managed. Uh, and so, and if you scour the literature, there's actually almost nothing. Uh, in terms of uh, complications. And so obviously complications happen to anything, but the rate is, is extremely low. Travis said, welcome you to comment on that. I yeah, just didn't yeah. want that concept to get perpetuated. No, 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 I don't wanna, I don't wanna perpetuate it. What I, what I was alluding to was um, uh, not so specifically treating jugular bulb abnormalities, but there was a period of time where 
there was enthusiasm about stenting the jugular veins proper. Uh, and about 10 years ago or so, um, for uh, it was believed that that could help treat multiple sclerosis. Um, there was some movement to stent jugular veins. This is now talking about the jugular vein proper. There were some incidences in that literature of stent migration um, uh, to the heart uh, that led to that practice sort of uh, dissipating um, for other reasons as well. Um, with respect to landing a stent within the skull, I think the risks are probably more comparable to dural venous sinus stenting, which we know is fairly safe. This, to the challenge is sizing the stents, et cetera. But I agree with you. I, I think the, the, the risk is considerably lower than what was being done before in the cervical jugular veins. Ravis, go, oh. go back to your slide 15. Uh, sure. Can you see my screen? No, you got to no. reshare. Oh, I got to reshare. One moment. it up, I would say that, um, you know, this is, we were as a center, not particularly aggressive and then adopting sort of approaching and, and thinking about venous uh, disease processes. In fact, uh, you know, the MS one was a cautionary tale. Uh, right. In fact, it's a credit to the neurointerventional space. Adam Siddiqui ran a trial which showed that it was not beneficial. Right. There were a lot of shucksters out there doing a lot of crazy stuff uh, for that. But, um, That's what I was alluding we, to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we've been slow uh, to adopt it because of our, um, our lack of clarity about the safety. But as the safety data has grown, uh, our, our comfort level has, has increased. And just one last comment before we move on, and this is for the residents. What Travis has done with having this knowledge base and expertise going to a place to do his fellowship where they were doing something that was very cutting edge and where he came away with a specific skill set is exactly what I'd like to encourage for you guys to do. Um, you know, the, Travis is a completely outstanding human being in and of his own right. And for that reason, you know, we'd love to have him on our team, but he was particularly attracted to us specifically because he was coming from a program where he had extensive knowledge and background in this sort of stuff. And he was bringing a new and unique set of skills and insight to our team. And so I would encourage all of you as you're going and looking at your fellowships and thinking about what you're doing, thinking about doing it in the context of um, you, know, you can bring a unique skill set to, to your place. So anyways, I'll stop with that. You go to the side, Dr. Benson. No, why do you think this is my favorite slide of his presentation? Um, for a variety of reasons, I we know no, there's only know. one reason. There's only one reason. <laughs> okay, you love anatomy. No, no. Okay. He, why is this? Why is this the most important slide for the residents of this presentation? Emily, Ray. I think it could potentially be an important cause of pulsatile tinnitus that we don't always think about. No, no. It's because he saved this case from his training. This was a case that he did during his fellowship. And he, he kept track of every single case that he did while he was learning. And here he is now, an attending in our neurosurgery department, showing what he learned as a fellow. So you know how often I've asked you to please keep track of what you're doing. Uh, so this is this is like the, the foundation of a full knowledge base. Uh, I, if you can only take one thing away from this talk, you should take this away. That uh, you know what you're seeing now will stay with you hopefully. And so you should pay attention to what, what it is. Sorry, I, I really wanted to get that 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 point across, but please go ahead with. I'm sure people have other questions. Travis, hey. 
14 percent of your cases um had a high risk angiographic a uh, hand uh, high risk of some sort of lesion um was that all patients with pulsatile tinnitus no 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 that that's a that's the subset of patients who have been uh who have been uh filtered um down to the point where we wanted to undertake um a neuroangiographic uh, evaluation so that that the that what i would say is that's in patients with suspected vascular pulsatile tinnitus there's a, a larger number of patients um who come in who have um you know other etiologies or non pulsatile tinnitus so i would say that what that number reflects is patients who we believe have a a vascular cause based on their neuroimaging, their non-invasive neuroimaging. And then they went on that subset of 165 patients uh, were ones that we brought to the angio suite for, for diagnostics. So in, in the global picture of pulsatile tinnitus, that number would be lower, but I would say it's a, it's a reasonable estimate in patients with vas the vascular subset of pulsatile tinnitus. And just to summarize again, what percentage of patients with pulsatile tinnitus will have a vascular etiology? Approximately uh, 75%, 70, 75%. On DSA? On, on a DSA evaluation. DSA. That includes the, the arterial, the arteriovenous, and venous abnormalities. Yeah. So we, we're still, and this is pretty consistent over time. Um, there's still about a quarter of patients, uh, a quarter to a third of patients who uh, we really cannot land on a diagnosis. And I think that just requires, you know, more work that that number seems stable, but again, we've had a shift in, in our understanding of, of the condition in the last 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, more work to be done. It could be something, um, you know, uh, you know, more physiologic you know, flow of endolymph. There's hypotheses about CSF pressure affecting endolymph currents and things like that. Um, so there are other potential mechanisms that wouldn't be captured uh, by an angiogram. Hey, Travis, I thought that was really exceptional. Um, you know, I, I didn't know that you could measure objectively pulsatile tinnitus before and, and kind of grade it objectively. I think that's extremely valuable. Um, is there a discussion about uh, the, on the tinnitus scale you showed about what's acceptable to treat or not, or does it really come down to the patient's subjective assessment of, of how annoying it is? Yeah, that's a really good question. In terms of thresholds, there aren't really good thresholds that are defined. So the, 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 the index I showed, the, the tinnitus functional index has, um, there's another one called the tinnitus handicap inventory, and it, it, it gives you a uh, buckets like mile i forget what they are but i know that the highest one is literally called catastrophic where if you if you get a certain score on the you know the instrument um i thought catastrophic is a little bit of an extreme term but um basically it, it's going to come down to how debilitating it is for the, the the patient's life and you know what the anticipated risk of treatment if you have a if you have something you can treat easily and safely a diverticulum for example um, or even a venous sinus stenosis, and the patient's really debilitated, they're scoring off the charts on their, their screening questionnaire, um, then I think you have that conversation. Uh, I think it, it really is patient dependent. There are a lot of people who will feel that they can live with it, that they don't want to stomach the risk of any procedure. But if they know that it's not going to cause them harm, you've effectively rolled out all the harmful things, including IIH, um, then they'll you know, be happy with that. Uh, and I think that's important as well. So there's no specific threshold, but some of the tinnitus questionnaires do stratify it into, into buckets, which can be useful. I was also, you, you were talking about the balloon test occlusion. It seems like if you blocked any point along the transverse and the sigmoid, you would also alter the flow along the rest of that vessel. Is anyone doing uh, temporary stenting where you put up a stent retriever? And I, I, I was I was going to talk about that the last minute I cut that I cut the slide. Up. So there's really not much in the literature about that. I know Dr. Mako has experience with that um, with the uh, with the Komenichi. I think it's a really interesting uh, strategy, right? You can essentially simulate what the flow would be like with the with a stent, right? And if you can eliminate and even temporarily angioplasty the stent, and the patient gets much better. 
that really gives you ammunition uh, to counsel the patient about, you know, venous sinus stenting. But the, there's really no literature on it so far. So yeah, we're we're writing the first report of it. Maze yeah. is, I mean, the draft is pretty much done. She's just selecting images. So yeah, uh, we'll I, 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 I think that's the way it's going to go. Yeah, no, I think that's. I mean, that tool, that tool wasn't even around, you know, when I was a, a fellow at our institution, but I really think it's, it really is, like you said, will, I think, become uh, potentially the tool of choice for, for troubleshooting these things. We've got two questions in the uh, chat here. Um, Dr. April asks, if it's a fistula, does that mean it's unilateral pulsatile tinnitus? More, more often than not. Um, unilateral, uh, uh, AV fistulas will cause unilateral pulsatile tinnitus. Um, we, we do see, I would say bilateral pulsatile tinnitus is more characteristic of intracranial hypertension, venous sinus stenosis. Um, in general, unilateral pulsatile tinnitus, um, is, uh, is the way it presents for a drill fistula. However, there are some people with really high flow shunts and a lot of redirection of blood across the, uh, uh, to the contralateral condylar veins, like across the uh, skull base. We'll sometimes have bilateral PT, even though the shunt is, is uh, on one side. But yes, more often than not, it's, it's unilateral and AV fistulas. Then Dr. Jenkins is asking, what's the long-term efficacy of stenting for venous stenting for venous eagle, uh, considering repeated trauma from the thyroid to the stent? Venus Eagle, that, so that's, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer for that. I would say that, you know, our practice was, um, again, a, a little bit of caution from the literature uh, of jugular venous stenting, which we alluded to earlier. Um, I, I think the mechanical, the mechanical impingement um, of the styloid and or C1 tubercle um, is less likely to respond well to a stent than, than, surger, than surgery. So we, we, in our practice, we wouldn't stent those. We would uh, refer them for a styloidectomy. There are reports of it, but I don't, have, I don't have good data on that. My speculation is that it's not gonna be as effective as, um, as surgery. Travis, do we do a trans canal recording it here? I wanna, I would like to find out. Um, so it's relatively simple from a hardware standpoint. It's more of the post-processing that I think takes a little bit more, but I would love to talk with the ENTs about that because, um, it really is, uh, I think the way of the future, uh, you know, a stethoscope is one thing, but I think if you can really show, I, I took out a slide I had when in an AV fistula where the transcanal recording looked like a Doppler of an artery, the same waveform. So you can really, and that was in an AB fistula. So you can really characterize, um, and more often, more important than that, you can show pre-post treatment changes in an objective way. So I would love to, I would love to investigate setting that up here. Well, I definitely would like to connect you, or get you connected. You may have already met Maura, Maura Cosetti. And also Joanna Jen, MD, PhD in neurology, who runs the neuroatology and neurogenetics program. There's there's a lot of depth and breadth at Mount Sinai, but as always, it's kind of spread out. And I'm sure that you could organize it. Yeah, one, one other note on that is we have sort of put together a little bit of a task force with a few of the ENT surgeons that have, you know, in the last while sent us some cases and we're sort of talking about how we can best coordinate and, and uh, organize a, a process. So Travis, Chris, and myself did a call with uh, three of the EMTs and we're trying to work through that as well. If there are additional contacts, like none of the people you just mentioned were part of that. So that would be helpful for us to figure out. So that is Travis, let's follow up on that. Great. Yeah, for sure. Great. All right, we're at nine o'clock here. Thanks so much, Travis. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks a lot. Great presentations.